this is that time of year when people think about what they're going to give up or what they're going to try to work harder on. All the festivities of the holiday season are over now. It's time to face reality. And the basic principle of reality is if you, there are certain things that if you want to gain them, you have to give other things up. We like to think of happiness as being like a big garden with all kinds of flowers, and the more kinds of flowers and plants, the better. But there are certain plants that will kill off the other plants. Like if you plant your garden full of eucalyptus saplings, they'll eventually kill everything else off. And it's the same way in the search for true happiness. There's truer happiness and less true happiness. And the search for happiness basically means making a trade. There are some things you've got to give up in order to gain things that are of more value. And discernment lies in figuring out what are the things of more value. This principle of trade-off is something we're doing all the time. It's just the question is, are the trades wise? Look at that description of the path that we chanted just now. And there's a lot of trade-offs. There are a lot of things you have to give up. And as the Buddha said, the path as a whole starts with generosity. That's one of the precursors of the path, one of the foundations. You're seeing that by being generous, you gain. You may lose the material object or whatever it is, but you gain a lot in return. And when you can appreciate that principle, then you're ready for the path. There's a lot of views you have to give up, or at least put them off to the side. It starts with the right view. We see that the big issue in life is suffering, and particularly the suffering that comes from craving. That's what we've got to focus on. And that means we have to give up a lot of other opinions. It actually requires that we give up a lot of our ideas about who we are. We take that question, who we are, and we put it off in brackets. And we look simply at our sense of self as an action. And then you can decide, is this something that's actually contributing to more suffering, or is it something that's helping put an end to suffering? And you begin to realize you have lots of different senses of self, and you've got to sort through them. It's like going up to your attic and realizing that you've got some treasures in the attic, but you've got a lot of junk. And you'd be better off getting rid of the junk. And the Buddha goes on, right resolve. Resolve for renunciation, for non-ill will, and for non-harmfulness. Non in, in other words, you give up your fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures. That's a huge part of the junk up in the attic. But of course, it's something we're really attached to. When you talk about Right resolve. It's easy to say that you, yes, you would like to learn how to not have so much ill will for other people, and you'd like to learn how not to be harmful. But a lot of people really resist the idea of renunciation. They think of it as a deprivation. They think of people who come out to the monastery like this are throwing away the happiness of lives, the real happiness that the human life can offer. But they don't realize that. We're looking for happiness at something else, and it's a happiness that requires a certain amount of giving up. In fact, right resolve connects directly with right concentration. The resolve from renunciation connects with that very first phrase in right con concentration, secluded from sensuality. In other words, you're not getting away from pleasures so much as you are getting away from your fascination with thinking about how you want this pleasure, how you want that pleasure, wouldn't this be nice, wouldn't that be nice? Realizing that a lot of those pleasures, when they come, then they go. And what are you left with? You're left with the actions that you did in order to get them. And then if they really were good, then you have the sense of really missing them, and you want to get them again. 
which the second time around, if the first time around happened to be skillful, well, maybe the second time might not be so skillful. You're setting yourself up for making a lot of mistakes. So you're resolving. You want to get the mind beyond that state. The Buddha would get people ready to think in these terms by first giving a talk on generosity, talk on virtue, then the rewards of generosity and virtue. Then he started talking about the drawbacks of sensuality, the pleasures that come from the rewards of being generous and being virtuous, if you just stay on the regular worldly level. And only when you begin to see that okay, the rewards of sensuality, even though they are nice rewards, they, they have their bad side. You start thinking, well, maybe it's good to have something better than that. That's when the Buddha said to be ready for the path. So you've got to look at your life. What are the things you've got to give up? The Buddha goes on and the other factors of the path through right speech, right action. Again, giving up certain ways of talking that are harmful, giving up certain ways of acting that are harmful, giving up ways of making your livelihood that are dishonest or harmful. And then you're ready to work on the mind. In other words, you've got to clear away a lot of, a lot of the underbrush, clear away a lot of the junk in your life if you want to have some space for the mind to develop. And so then you have right effort. Here again, there's a trade. You work on skillful qualities, but you've got to let go of the unskillful ones. And a lot of the unskillful ones, if you can see them in those terms, will be easier to give up. But all too often you don't see them as unskillful. Sensual desire comes up and you say, oh, this is the spice of life. Ill will comes up and you think, well, this person really deserves to suffer. Sleepiness, drowsiness come up. You can convince yourself, oh, I've been working really hard. It's time for a rest. Restlessness comes up, and you can convince yourself that the things that you're worried about really aren't worth worrying about. Doubts about the practice come up. Doubts about yourself. And you can convince yourself these things really are doubtful. In other words, we tend to side with these things. And it's a major shift to begin to see that these friends that you've had, these little pets you've had, really are harmful. And you might want to get past them. This is called generating desire. We're not giving up all desires as we practice. In fact, we've got a very strong desire for true happiness. This is what drives this trade-off that we're making. There was that article that appeared in Israel recently about the monastery, and some of the feedback was, I feel sorry for all these people, they've just given up so much for, for what? For nothing. As if we've given up all our desires and see nothing but bad things in the world. Well, we see that there's a lot of bad in the world, but we see that there's a lot of good, too, if we focus our desire in the right place. And this is how we come to meditation practice of mindfulness. You strip things away, all your greed and distress with reference to the world, and that's what the practice has been aimed at so far. And you stay simply with the breath in and of itself, the mind in and of itself, as you've got it right here. When things are stripped down like this, you find that there's a certain sense of well-being that can be developed as you stay focused. That can grow really, really intense. That's how you get into concentration. Thinking about the breath, evaluating the breath, making it more comfortable, and letting that sense of comfort spread throughout the body. That's a sense of comfort that doesn't come when the mind is fascinated with sensuality. Sensuality here is the, the eucalyptus tree or the eucalyptus brush that you've got to get rid of if there's going to be room for the things, the good things in the garden of the mind to flower. And then as you read through the different stages of concentration, you get so you, you can drop this, you drop the evaluation and direct the thought when they've done their work. And there's an even greater sense of pleasure, greater sense of rapture. And then the rapture becomes unpleasant. 
becomes disturbing. In other words, your sensitivity has grown greater. So what seemed really nice to begin with, now you begin to say, well, it's not so nice after all. There'd be something quieter, something better. You drop that. Even then, even the pleasure that fills the body, you say, that's gross too. The mind reaches a state of perfect balance and equanimity, an extreme sense of well-being. That is from that sense of well-being that you can look at the ways in which the mind creates its suffering for itself, and you can begin to pry them away. So the practice from the very beginning is the practice of seeing that there's a trade, and there's certain things you've got to give up if you want to get something better. And it's a series of wise trades all the way down the line. There's a parable in the canon where these two men have gone into a village that's been abandoned. It was abandoned in a hurry, so they figure, well, there must have been a lot of good stuff left behind. Let's go check it out. So they go and they find some flax, the plant from which linen is made. So they bundle up the flax. And then they go on and they find some linen thread. And the first man says, okay, this is what we got the flax for, it's for the linen thread. Let's throw away our flax and just take the linen thread. And the second person says, well, no, I worked hard bundling up this flax. I'll just carry what I've got. So the first man throws away the flax, takes the linen thread. The second one takes just the flax. And from there they find things of more and more value. There's linen cloth, and then there's silver, and then there's gold. And in each case, the first man throws away what he's got and takes the better item, whereas the second man says, well, I worked really hard on this flax, I'll hold on to it. So this is basically an illustration for the path. You find that you've got good things to hold on to begin with, but then you find better things. But you've got to let go of the earlier things if you're going to get the better things. It's a trade. But it's a trade-up in each case. So the people are not willing to make the trade, they're just left with flax. The people make the trade, they end up with the gold. So renunciation is not deprivation, it's a trade. And it's a trade that, if it's done wisely, leads to true joy, leads to true well-being. It comes from the mature realization that we can't have everything we want. So we've got to decide what's really worth the effort. And it turns out that if you're willing to give up certain things, the rewards are greater than the things you gave up. It's not where we're simply saying, well, I'll just content myself with this little corner over here. We're not putting ourselves into a corner, we're putting ourselves into an open door that opens to something really wide. So by the time you reach the goal, there is no regret at all with the things you give up. You found something infinitely better. So look at what you're holding on to and ask yourself, because it's really worth holding on to. Is this the flax or is there something better? Where is the gold here? There is gold in human life, and it's not in the element of gold. It's the, the gold of a mind that's been well-trained, that's seen that there really is a deathless element inside. So even though we're often not conscious of the fact that we're making trade-offs and closing off certain options, you have to be alert to the fact that that's exactly what we're doing all the time. We're always making a trade. And the better part of wisdom is knowing how to trade up. 